Okay, um, my talk's going to be a little strange, at least from my point of view, because the first half is a sort of history talk, and I'm not a historian, and uh, I can't say that I did a whole lot of original research. I looked at it. most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is from secondary sources. And the second half of my talk um, is going along with Mike Rosen's talk. We are sort of the token algebraic number theorists. And uh, it's important to remember in an era where arithmetic geometry is becoming uh, more and more important that many of the roots of arithmetic geometry come from algebraic number theory and that much of the work on Fermat what came is very much in the tradition of algebraic number theory. So uh, I was originally going to begin my talk with a thing from the Lone Ranger about, you know, you know, writing from days of yore, but um, I couldn't get the quote, so. Anyway, I thought it were appropriate to start with the actual page, which is a, f well, not the actual page, it's a, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> although there are some copies, I mean, uh, this is the eighth question in book two of Diphantus, and for those who have little Latin and less Greek, um, it's asked to divide a square into two other squares. In other words, when is the uh, sum of two squares a square? And as is typical of Diphantus, he gives specific examples. In this case, he's looking at uh, 16 minus 1, 15. So he wants to divide 16. Well, anyway. Uh, and that's the original, well, not the original Greek. That's a copy of something from the 13th century, which is the 14th century, which is the earliest known manuscript. We don't quite know when it uh, occurred. And this, of course, is the observation of Pierre de Fermat. Uh, this is the edition of Diphantus that his son Samuel collected. And um, Fermat had the habit of writing in margins. As, and, and we'll get to that in a second. But anyway, I thought it appropriate to begin by showing you the page. We'll get back to this a little bit later. I thought next it appropriate to actually show you the only known picture of Fermat. <laughs> this is taken from his uh, collected papers, uh, except he didn't have any papers, so it's, it's actually <laughs> called uh, his Varia, and it consists of essentially things that his son collected from various of Fermat's correspondence, uh, and that's a picture of him. Anyway, and so the story starts, of course, with Diphantus. Unfortunately, we don't know anything about Diphantus. We don't even know when he lived. Um, uh, based on an 11th century letter, it's assumed he lived in the 3rd century. There's a, there's a story told that he dedicated his Arithmetica to a famous bishop, Dionysus, who, who was appointed uh, bishop in 236. So. Uh, People think he, uh, he lived around 250 in the common era, 250 AD. Uh, his Arithmetica consisted of 13 books, of which six books survived in a Greek manuscript that was discovered in the 14th century in the Vatican Library by a man named Regimantus, who was a fairly famous uh, polymath of the, of, the early, of the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. Um, there, this, this thing had six books out of 13. Of course, the problem is, they didn't like put chapters in tables of contents, so it's unclear whether the six books were more than six books. We know we're missing at least some parts. We're missing the parts having to do with the quadratic formula, simple quadratic equations. But exactly how much is missing wasn't known until very recently, and it's still not completely known, but a corrupt Arabic manuscript recently turned up oh, about five or ten, I guess it was, well, I mean, to say it turned up, it always been around. I mean, we just found, we just, <laughs> someone found it and decided to translate it, and Springer actually published it as is Springer's. In, in their history of math series. So we know a little bit more, but basically um, we still don't know what, what was entirely in the Arithmetica. And what's other, also interesting is uh, he wrote a book called Porisms, of which we know even less, except that presumably was where the theorems were. If you look at the Arithmetica, you think it was written by someone who won the Putnam in, in the year 250 <laughs> Common Era. Uh, there are no theorems, and there are lots of clever tricks. Um, you know, you add this, you subtract this, you do this, and the miracles happen, and then the roof goes up. So um, the porism, on the other hand, which we know nothing about except some really fragments, seems to have been more of a systematic treatise with actual theorems. You know, for example, the uh, a squared plus a plus b squared equals a squared plus b squared plus 2ab is there, for example. And, and the other thing about that, Francis, is kind of interesting is um, he, really, he really thought in a way different than earlier Greeks, at least we think he did, because 
a lot of his things are actually equations, and he handled things up to degree six. And, and that's sort of confusing for the Greeks, because after cubes, there's no geometric interpretation. So, so Diphantus really was an um, unusual person. It's a shame we don't know anything more about him. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, we do know one thing, because um, he lived to the age of 84, because there is an amusing, in a, a collection of uh, sort of silly problems, uh, there's, a, there's a little word problem, a high school word problem about, which I didn't write down, but just something like, you know, he was born at X, his son lived to Y, he grew a beard at Z, and then you solve it and you get that he died at 84. <laughs> uh, but since we don't know when he lived, that makes it difficult to know when he died. <laughs> okay, um, okay, so as I said, the, it's just a problem book, and this is an example of a problem. Uh, to find two numbers such that their sum is in a given proportion to the sum of their squares. But again, he wouldn't have written it this way. He did it, if you look at Diphantus, he actually did it for c equals 10, and then just, you know, he didn't do it for the arbitrary c because he had no notion of an arbitrary uh, thing. And now, um, let me end my little discussion of Diphantus with a, a little tidbit that I found. Uh, my younger brother's a historian, and he told me when one gives a history lecture, if one doesn't have tidbits, one audience quickly goes bored. So this is my tidbit about Diphantus. Uh, Oystein Orr, I haven't seen the earliest known manuscript. It's in the Vatican Library. Uh, but Oystein Orr, who was a fairly well-known algebraist at Yale, but also a very interesting, interested in history of mathematics, says in his book on number theory and history that the earliest known manuscript uh, of Diphantus has the following marginal note, written by a scribe. And it says, thy soul diphantus to Santanus for the difficulty of thy problems, and this one in particular. <laughs> now, um, what makes it even more piquant is, please note, it says problem eight, book two. <laughs> Let me remind you about something about problem eight, book two. So problem eight, book two, has a long history of marginal notes. <laughs> um, OK, so then the question is, what happened? Well, um, so this manuscript was discovered in, oh, essentially the 15th century, and nothing happened. And then a man who's usually called Zylander, whose real name is William Holtzman, who lived uh, <coughs> who lived uh, in the early 16th century, actually prepared a translation a year before he died, uh, maybe uh, into Latin. And he wasn't, I mean, he, he was a smart man, but he really wasn't much of a mathematician, so the translation is regarded as corrupt, although, um, you know, since I have, actually I have some Greek, but no Latin, I couldn't really uh, tell you. Um, the important thing is that this man, Cord Gaspar Bachet de Meserac, who lived 1581-1638, prepared an improved translation which contained the original Greek on, uh, on parallel sides. Now, Bachet was kind of an interesting guy. He, the de means he was a minor noble, uh, as was Fermat, the so-called member of the noblesse de robe. De robe. Uh, he was uh, quite a good calculator. Um, and of course, in those days, it's sort of like when we were growing up. People thought that mathematical ability had something to do with calculational ability. And we know now it doesn't, but um, he was quite, you know, in an era when, when, when people weren't so good at ar arithmetic, to be a mental calculator was quite unusual. So he was regarded as quite a sharp guy. Um, and he prepared a translation. Um, and a co I haven't seen an original copy of this, but according to John Coates, who told Alf, who, who I looked at Alf's book, um, Apparently, it had quite wide margins. Um, anyway, Fermat owned a that appeared in 1621. Fermat owned a copy, and he was inclined to doodle in it. as It had fairly wide margins. So, so that takes us to Fermat, where the story starts. So what do we know about Fermat? We know a fair amount about Fermat, actually. Um, so he was born not almost, it's almost the, uh, very close to the 400th, it's like the three, in another week, it'll be the 394th anniversary of his birth. He came from a relatively prosperous family. His mother was of a very minor nobility. Uh, he, too, reached that level, so that's why the de is in his name. He trained in a, as a lawyer, and he worked in the civil service, so he was a bureaucrat. <laughs> However, it is worth noting 
that um, he wasn't a very good bureaucrat. Uh, <laughs> There's extant a letter of 1663 by his superior to Colbert, who was the minister of France at the time, describing Fermat as the following ways. He was a man of great erudition, has contact with men of learning everywhere, but he is rather preoccupied, and he does not report cases well, and he's confused. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, Perhaps one of the reasons he was preoccupied is that he was very much involved in what was going on in mathematics at the time. He uh, worked on analytic geometry, pro probability with Pascal. There are letters. He, he, was, he was essentially uh, in correspondence with every uh, sharp person in Europe in, in the 17th centuries. He worked with Pascal on probability. He worked on max-min problems and quadrature. Quadrature is the old term for integration. So. Um, there was quite a tradition in the, before Newton of people sort of doing special cases of the calculus, and Pascal did quite a lot of work in that. Um, his number theory work started around um, 1630, as far as we can tell, but we, since he was, and basically it just consisted of letters to people, and some of the, as you can see, the first two names are, of course, among the most well-known people in the 17th century, Pascal and Descartes. Descartes apparently couldn't care less about number theory. Uh, Pascal was also not so interested at the time. He uh, was starting to get involved in the uh, in religion, and that seemed to take him away from mathematics. Mersenne, we know from Mersenne primes and Frenichel de Bézy, Huygens, Digby, and a man named Jacques de Belay, who will reappear because um, uh, Fermat. I don't know how. Nobody knows quite why, but de Belay managed to con out of Fermat in some letters the way Fermat worked, and those became a very important part of. Uh, uh, the varia that was collected by his son. Um, a lot of times what Fermat would do would say, hey, I can do this, can you? <laughs> in particular, um, he was very concerned, there's a very amusing little quote. Um, so uh, one of the things he did is he moved away from rational solutions, Isla Dalfantis, to only allowing inter-solutions. Um, this one of the challenge probably set in 1657 to other mathematicians. That was one of the examples. And this was a quote um, from a letter of, where he said, so let arithmetic reclaim the doctrine of whole numbers as a patrimonial all its own. So he was really consisted in integer solutions. Um, anyway, but he never published anything in his lifetime. So we know very little about um, how he thought. Um, what we do know, uh, basically, is the, the notes left on Fermat's edition of Bachet. We all know about some of those. Um, I should stop and say this. Look, there is absolutely no evidence that Fermat ever conjectured the last theorem in any of his letters to anybody. All we have is the case of n equals 3 and n equals 4. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I would like my hypothetical son collecting my marginal doodles in, ma in math books and then publishing someday. There's absolutely no evidence that Fermat wanted his marginal notes published. I mean, these were things he doodled, and he probably didn't go back and erase his comment about the last theorem when, because, um, uh, going a little out of order, but oh well. Because, um, about two years after the hypothetical date of the last theorem, there is a letter to uh, one of his correspondents that implies that he knew that x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed and x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z fourth has no integral solutions. So uh, already two years after the hypothetical date of the last theorem, he was only talking about three and four. And, you know, given the fact that he liked to challenge people, it's reasonable to conjecture that he would have said and, and, and so on if he really thought he at that point had a proof. So, you know, I think, you know, the betting is that uh, he probably didn't have a proof. N equals 4 is kind of interesting because it's the only one for which we have his proof by infinite descent. I'll probably give the proof when I, get to, when I start being back to being a mathematician when I go back to blackboards. Um, it's observation 45 in the last proposition of the Diophantes. And, uh, but it's, it's, just, it's very interesting because, uh, okay, so that takes us through most of the elementary history. Okay, and then we have the sort of history of Fermat to Kummer. 
So what sure, okay, what sort of everyone knows, from r did n equals four, via x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared, which I will point out is an elliptic curve as opposed to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth, which is not an elliptic curve. So it's sort of amusing that it's done that way. Euler in 1733 did n equals three. Well, he sort of did it because there's some holes. Dirichlet, I mean, actually his first pub paper tried to do n equals five, but he had a hole, so Lagrange fixed it. This field has a tradition of A proving, saying they proved something and B fixing it. Uh, Lamey did n equals seven and Dirichlet did n equals 14 and then came Kummer. However, it's important to have a little aside because um, um, we all know that Gauss was the greatest mathematician and there are, Gauss had a very interesting um, history of Fermat. He'll come up in a, in a couple of places in this talk. But um, the first thing is, well, there's this letter to Obers in 1816 says, this is right after the Paris Academy offered a prize for Fermat. I confess that Fermat's theorem as an isolated proposition has very little interest to me because I could easily lay down a multitude of such propositions which one could neither prove nor disprove of. The trouble with that is he spent an awful lot of time thinking about it. Well, I don't mean an awful lot of time. By Gauss's standards, it probably wasn't a whole lot of time. But um, uh, he certainly wrote a proof down for three. But what's more interesting is he wrote a proof down for five before Dirichlet and and he also remarks uh, according, that it, his methods won't work for seven. Now it seems to me if someone sort of proves it and then thinks about why their methods aren't going to work in the higher case, they aren't really regarding the problem as totally trivial. Uh, so it's very interesting. Um, and of course, um, what Gauss did was look at the ring of integers in Q omega and the fifth roots of unity, and there the units are quite manageable, but for seven the units already start getting unmanageable. So, uh, so it's sort of interesting that Gauss uh, did these things. Um, okay, so now we can, uh, I have to hurry because I want to do some mathematics because I'm more better at that. Um, okay, now we can do a little sociology uh, uh, study. So in 1816, the Paris Academy offered a prize. Then again in 1850, they gave it to Kummer for his work, even though, of course, he didn't quite serve it. And then, of course, came the Welschkel Prize of 1908 after Paul Welschkel's death. He was a minor mathematician. He actually did some work on Fermat, nothing of great significance. Oh, oh boy, I made a typo. It's 100,000 marks, and I wrote a million marks. I apologize. <laughs> that would really be a lot. Anyway, it was 100,000 marks. Um, and it's, it took me a while to figure out, uh, to try to figure, you know, you, you, one says that, but it's hard to sort of figure out what that means. And there are various ways of figuring out what it means. Um, I came up with a couple. Again, I'm not a historian, so these are, I'm not sure how historians do this, but um, this was a time when, gold, when money was completely interchangeable into gold. And it's possible, I tracked down what the uh, gold equivalent of 100,000 marks was, and it was 39,825 grams of gold, or 87, almost 88 pounds of gold, which is not an insignificant amount of money. In current dollars, that would be, I don't know, $400 an ounce. You can figure it out yourself. It's about a half a million dollars. But that's really not a good way to figure it out. A better way to figure it out is it's about 50 times a skilled workman's salary. So it's probably the buying power on the order of two to three million dollars. So it was a very not, not insignificant amount of money. Um, and we will return to the Welsh Gold Prize again in our, when we go a little bit further in the sociology. So, but it's, okay. And of course, for Ma, once the Welsh Gold Prize uh, appeared, um, you know, lots of people came out of the wood trying to solve it, uh, and it became even more famous than it had been. One of the things I tried to track down, and I must confess I was unable to, is when the first occurrence of Fermat's last theorem was. The earliest one I could find was about 1850 in a, in a paper of Smith. Uh, what's interesting to note is that in other languages it's not often, it is sometimes called Fermat's last theorem, but sometimes it's not. Only in English is that the most common usage. So if anyone happens to know when the first occurrence was, I'd be real interested in finding out. I wasn't able to find out because it's sort of, one would have to sort of look at all papers. Uh, it's hard, you know, it's sort of hard to prove, to find a sort of first occurrence because, you know, one has to go back to Gutenberg. Okay. And then some more sociology. Um, there's an absolutely wonderful story, which I'll read an excerpt from in a minute, called The Devil and Simon Flagg by Arthur Porges that appeared in 1954, which uh, 
which basically, the, uh, this sh it's a short story, and um, well, that became very popular, it appeared in Fantasia Mathematica, and I'll be reading a, a little bit of it in a second. Um, what is more important um, was probably, I mean, this is a conjecture on my part, because Andrew doesn't remember, but um, Andrew says that he was, got interested in, in Fermat's problem in high school, and he read a book on it. The chances are, this was the book he read, because this is the only book that I was able to trace down that was really on Fermat's last theorem that was a popular book. This was the last book that Eric Temple Bell wrote before he died. Like all of Eric Temple book, Bell's book, it's, wonder, it's a wonderful read, and it's not completely correct. This is, a, <laughs> this is, an act, this is the original edition. It's been reprinted by the, by the MAA. Uh, that is supposed to be Fermat. It doesn't really look much like Fermat to me. It's sort of a generic Frenchman, but... Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's a wonderful book. It's very crotchety, and, uh, and I recommend it highly. And, and the point is that he said, you know, he begins the book by saying something to the effect, you know, when, if mankind perishes, this was, the, this was a couple years before the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was a thought on people's minds, uh, that, you know, what will, what will remain if, if Martians come or something or other? And he said, you know, they, they are the problems of, of, of good and evil and all these other things. But he said those are kind of vague and ill-formed. <laughs> So, but, but there will be two problems, he said, that he suspects will still be around. And one of those was um, the Goldbach conjecture, and the other one is Fermat. Well, one down, one to go, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, and then, of course, uh, the sociology of today, um, you know, um, what do we have? Well, what do we know? We know... Um, There were front page articles in major newspapers. There was Marilyn Vosavant, who's a popular columnist, who wrote a really execrable column and then turned it into an even uh, more equally execrable book, you know, taking a whole bunch of people's name in vain is the only way to describe it, you know, Carl and Barry and a couple of other people. Uh, and she, her problem was, you said that since, it, since uh, there's, uh, that somehow the non-Euclidean methods used, whatever that means, <laughs> I couldn't quite... <laughs> make, uh, uh, you know, sort of made the proof not a proof. And then, of course, there's this conference, which um, is probably the largest conference ever organized on a single topic in mathematics that anyone I know has heard of. So anyway, before I start the math, there are a couple of things I want to read to people. Okay. Oop. Okay, here are the rules for the Wolfschel Prize that are relevant. Um, uh, so... By the way, the prize is still worth something, probably on the order of 20,000 marks. They didn't invest it too wisely during the inflation period in the 20s, but <laughs> what the heck. Uh, you know, when it's, it's, it's amazing to calculate, you know, if they had gotten something like 2% or 3% a year. I mean, you know, by the rule of 72, 100,000 marks would, even if you got 3% a year in, in it's, it's almost 90 years, so it would double every 24 years, right? So it would be worth, you know, it would just be enormous, but <laughs> that's life. I mean, um, okay, well, anyway, um, here's the relevant parts. It says the society, um, this is my favorite part, but I, um, it just says, the, and I don't, the society keeps the right of decision in the case where various persons would have dealt with the solution of the problem or for the case where the solution is a result of the combined efforts of several scholars, in particular in what concerns the partition of the prize at its own discretion. The award of the prize by the society will take place not earlier than two years after the publication of the memoir to be crowned. The interval of time is aimed to allow the German and foreign mathematicians to voice their opinion about the validity of the solutions published. So that is the story. And that ends my, uh, well, I'll have a little more sociology, uh, but I think we can get dispensed with this and go back to doing mathematics at this point. I'm sorry? I can't hear very well, so someone will have to relay the question. I'm sorry? I was told it was about 20,000 Deutschmarks now. Oh, you asked. And how much is it? Oh, okay. Okay, so it's gone, okay. I, 
Good. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, I have a couple of more sociological things, and then I want to get into some math things. Um, I'll, I want to read you an excerpt from The Devil and Simon Flagg. So it begins, um, after several months of the most arduous research involving the study of countless faded manuscripts, Simon Flagg succeeded in summoning the devil. Um, as a competent medievalist, his wife had proved invaluable. A mere mathematician himself, he was hardly equipped to decipher Latin holographs, particularly when complicated by rare terms from 10th century demonology. Um, the devil, um, uh, Simon said, suppose you listen to a proposition from me for a change. At least it's a straightforward one. The devil irritably twirled his tail tip with one hand, much as a man might toy with his keychain. Uh, obviously he felt injured. All right, the devil said, it can't do any harm, let's hear your proposition. I will pose a certain question, Simon began, to be answered within 24 hours. If you cannot do so, you must pay me $100,000. Um, and then it goes on to say, the devil doesn't take that um, deal. Um, he says, I only deal in souls. Uh, there's no shortage of slaves. The amount of free, un wholehearted service I receive from you, man, and he will amaze you. So anyway, uh, the story goes on, and the um, devil says, of course, your question must have an answer. It can't be like the Middle Ages, when people asked me questions about a village where one barber who shaves all those and only those who don't shave themselves. Um, and then it goes on a little bit further, and uh, Simon finally asks, okay, let's have the question. As soon as I answer it, we'll hurry off. Um, I have just time for another client tonight. All right, said Simon, he took a deep breath. My question is this, is Fermat's last theorem correct? Uh, the devil gulped for the first time his ear of assurance weakened. Who's last what? He asked in a hollow voice. <laughs> Fermat's last theorem, it's a mathematical proposition which Fermat, a 17th century French mathematician, claimed to have proved. However, his proof was never written down, and to this day nobody knows if the theorem is true or false. Mathematics, the devil explained, horrified. Do you think I've had time to waste learning such stuff? <laughs> but as for, I've studied the trivium and the quadrivium, but as for algebra, say, um, oh well. Anyway, time and space are easy for you, Simon said, aren't they? Uh, this is just a simple matter. It's just a question of positive integers. Uh, what's a positive integer, the devil flared, or an integer for that matter? <laughs> To put it more formally, Simon said, ignoring the devil's question, Fermat's theorem states there are no non-trivial rational solutions of the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals e to the n for n a positive integer greater than 2. Okay, and so things go on, and um, the devil uh, returns four hours later saying, I find the fundament fundamentals of algebra, trigonometry, and plane geometry. Uh, but... Um, um, haven't solved it yet, and then he goes on. And finally, 10 minutes before the uh, 24 hours are over, um, Simon put on Bach, played by Landowska. Uh, it's 10 more minutes, Simon said. If he's not back with the solution by then, we've won. I'll give him credit. He could get a PhD out of my school in one day <laughs> with honors. However, there was a hiss. Rosy clouds mushroomed sulfurously. The devil stood before them, steaming noisingly on the rug. His shoulders sagged, his eyes were bloodshot, and a town poor still clutching a sheaf of papers shook violently from fatigue or knaves. Silently, with a kind of seething dignity, he flung the papers to the floor where he trampled them viciously with his cloven hoofs. Gradually then, his tense figure relaxed and a wry smile twisted in his mouth. You win, Simon, he said it almost in a whisper, eyeing him with ungrudging respects. Not even I can learn enough mathematics in such a short time for so difficult a problem. The more I get into it, the worse it becomes. Non-unique factorization ideals. Do you know he, do you know he confide, confided not even the best mathematicians on other planets, all far ahead of yours, have solved it? Well, there's a chap on Saturn. He looks something like a mushroom on stilts. Even he, he's given up. And then... Finally, um, okay, 
Uh, Simon kissed his wife hard. A long while later, she, uh, she stirred in his arms, darling. She shouted, what's wrong now? Nothing, except I'd like to see his work so far to know how close he came. <laughs> he broke off amazed at the devil flashback. Satan seemed oddly embarrassed. I forgot, he mumbled. I need to... Um, he stooped for the scattered papers, gathering and smoothing them tenderly. It certainly gets you, he said, avoiding Simon's gaze. Impossible to stop just now. Why, if I can only prove one simple lemma? <laughs> he, said the bla um, he said the blazing interest. He saw the blazing interest in Simon and dropped his apologetic air. Say, he grunted, you've worked on this, I'm sure. Did you try continued fractions? <laughs> uh... Mr. Flag, Mrs. Flagg sighed. Suddenly the devil seemed a familiar figure, a little different from old Professor Atkins, her husband's colleague at the university. Anytime two mathematicians get together on a tantalizing problem, so resignedly she left the room, coffee pot in hand. There certainly was a long session in, not, in sight. <laughs> okay. Okay, now I want to, um, uh, in the time that's remaining, I want to sort of do... Um, some mathematics for you. Uh, it's kind of interesting mathematics in a way because um, um, we we don't prior to Fr Gerhard Fry's amazing discovery, we had basically been using techniques from algebraic number theory, and um, and it seemed pretty clear. And I'll try to give some reasons for it that. Um, if you look at the case, um, so, of course, I should, we just probably should have made a sign and left this on the, um, if, you start, if you're an algebraic number theorist, um, actually, I, can, I don't know if I'll get into trouble from this, but one could sort of say that from an algebraic number theory point of view, Ken's paper is a paper on Fermat's last theorem, but Andrew's is not, and the reason is the following. Number th algebraic number theorists always divide for, my, for very real, real reasons into two cases. P divides x, y, z, and P doesn't divide x, y, z. Oh, oh, should do. Sorry. Uh, um, and this is the so-called second case, because, and this is the first case. And uh, what's amusing to note is, as as I guess Brian was, Conrad was trying to impress on me, is that if you look at Ribbit's paper, there are in fact different techniques needed in the first case and the second case, because in one case you're removing level P, and in one case you're removing something not at level P. Oop, yep. um, but if you look at Weil's paper, there's nothing about P, the P and the Fermat curve at all. It's all at three and five. So the point of view of a number theorist, um, the distinction of, into first and second case has more or less vanished in Weil's paper, because you're using modularity at 3 and 5. But it's still there in Ken's paper, so I view that as sort of interesting. Um, anyway, um, uh, I will try to explain why algebraic number theorists, you, you know, sort of expected the first case to fall long ago and, um, in my talk, and then Mike will explain what little knowledge we have about the second case, of course, prior to the amazing. Uh, work, uh, but before I do that, I think it's appropriate to do the case n equals four, or at least start it off, because this is the only uh, only proof we have by Fermat. And the proof I'm going to give you is essentially Fermat's proof, uh, except for one little part that I can't resist. Um, so the first thing Fermat does is he he says he's going to work on this equation, which, as I mentioned, makes everything into an elliptic curve. And what he uses is the well-known characterization of Pythagorean triples that x, you know, obviously, so it's really a Pythagorean, that if you have any Pythagorean triple, uh, you know, x equals m squared minus n squared and y equals 2mn and z equals m squared plus n squared. And since I'm supposed to be the token algebraic number theorist, I can't resist giving my, my favorite proof of this. Um, in keeping with the spirit of this talk, what I should do is draw a circle and then draw a line through the circle and say rationally parameterize the circle. And that will give you the equations uh, very quickly. But since I'm an algebraic number theorist, I can't resist the following proof. 
suppose x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And then look at this number. This has norm 1. So by Hilbert's theorem 90, it's of the form m plus ni <laughs> over m minus ni. Now compare real and imaginary parts. <laughs> but for those who, you know, you could do this. <laughs> Anyway, um, OK, so basically the proof you know, sort of proceeds in the obvious fashion when just ups by modern, what the hell? <laughs> one sort of, you know, if, as a, one just sort of substitutes away and says, I think I need an organizer. <laughs> you know, you sort of, I'll just start you along the, you know, you go x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z squared. And then you sort of go uh, x squared, therefore, is, um, I'll use a and b because um, a squared minus b squared and y squared is 2ab. And z is a squared plus b squared. You know, and then you kind of just kind of do some obvious manipulations. You go y squared equals 2. Um, let's see, how do I want to do this? Um, OK. OK, well, this is another Pythagorean triple. So you get c and, c and d. Right? This is x squared plus b squared equals a squared. So then you play the same game with, with B and, and A. And when you do all your sort of silly substitutions, you end up something like this. So you get Y squared equals 4CD times C squared plus D squared. These are all relatively prime. So you get all, everything in sight is a perfect square, and so you get C. I'm leaving out a lot of steps, of course. You get C is E squared, and D is F squared. And then you plop these back into the equation. Since C squared plus D squared is itself a perfect square, you end up, when you finally do end up with what you end up with, is E to the fourth plus F to the fourth is, is something G squared because, and that, and then g will be too small. So that's the infinite descent. You just keep on substituting until you get an equation of, small, of the same type that's smaller. Uh, the details will be in the margins of the book. Um, but seriously, I mean, this is the proof that Fermat used. And he basically, you, it's really, by modern standards, there's nothing there. I mean, you just sort of keep on substituting away until you, until you and simplifying and keeping track of what's relatively prime to what, and then you end up with the proof. I absolutely don't want to say anything about n equals 3 or n equals 5, because uh, it's better just to do them once and for all uh, using unique factorizations in Q zeta p. Um, instead, I want to concentrate on what we know about the first case. And I want to sort of explain why the first case is uh, so interesting to mathematicians, to number theorists. Um, the first, the, 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 the realization that the first case was uh, important uh, perhaps goes back to Euler, but, but from our point of view, it really uh, occurs with Sophie Germain's theorem. Uh, Sophie Germain was a, a woman uh, who was born of an upper middle class family in France um, and basically did mathematics as a hobby. She did it um, under a pseudonym at the beginning. And there's a very famous letter from, uh, she corresponded with Gauss and, and Legendre, actually was quite acquainted with her. And Legendre was the one who presented all her papers. She won the uh, Ca Prize Academy for work on elasticity and partial differential equations. Um, so she was quite broad. Um, but anyway, the, the amusing thing is there's a well-known letter, well, perhaps not so well-known, but, but should be better known, um, 
Gauss was a kind of prickly individual, and he sometimes um, treated people well and other times treated people quite poorly. Um, but um, he seemed to um, uh, treat Monsieur LeBlanc as he knew her quite well. And then when he found out that she was uh, actually Sophie Germain, he wrote a letter which I want to read to you because I think it should be better known. Uh, it goes something like this. But how to describe to you my aberration and astonishment at seeing my esteemed correspondent, Mr. LeBlanc, metamorphosize himself into this illustrious personage. A taste for the abstract sciences in general, and above all the mysteries of numbers, is excessively rare. It is not a subject which strikes everyone. The chanting charms of this sublime science reveal themselves only to those who have the courage to go deeply into it. But when a person of that sex, which according to our customs and prejudice, must encounter infinitely more difficulties than men to familiarize herself with these thorny researches, succeeds nonetheless in surmounting these obstacles and penetrating the most obscure parts of them, then without doubt she must have the noblest courage, quite extraordinary talents, and a superior genius. Indeed, nothing could prove to me in so flattering and less equivocal a manner that the attractions of this science which has enriched my life with so many joys, are not chimerical as the pre predilection with which you have honored it. There's a letter of Gauss to Sophie Germain. So what did Sophie Germain do? Well, she proved a fairly elementary theorem by modern, modern standards, but it's a wonderful theorem. Um, and, it's, and it goes something like this. Um, well, it's the first version. So this is the theorem of Sophie Germain. It says if P is an odd prime, uh, such that 2P plus 1 is also prime, then the first case is true. And the reason why this is extremely significant is this was the first general theorem on Fermat. No, I mean, this is a general theorem that gave you criterion. Now, it's true that the most obvious case, 3, you don't need it, because in the first case, if you want to look at p equals 3, you can reduce mod 9. But um, it does give you a general theorem about Fermat. And then Legendre, using her techniques, essentially managed to extend this to 4p plus 1, 8p plus 1. 10p plus 1, and 14p plus 1, and 16p plus 1. And if any of these were prime, then you would have the first case as well. And using this, they eliminate all the primes less than 100. So essentially, by 1815, we knew the first case was true for all primes less than 100. Now we know, well, now we know the first case is true for all primes. but. Uh, <laughs> Up to a year or two ago, we knew that the first case was true for quite a large number, which we'll figure into our discussions in a second. Okay, um, time is going short. So I, um, uh, people, uh, then the next theorem of note is the so-called Weferich criterion. Again, I'll, I'll give complete proofs of all these theorems. Well, probably not the Weferich theorem, which I think is one of the ugliest proofs in mathematics. But, uh, uh, Weferich proved around 1900 that if, that if you had a, a counterexample to the first, if, that unless, well, I guess I'll say it this way, unless 2 to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p squared, the first case is true. And this is a... Um, this is a fairly unlikely situation to occur because if you think of residues of 2 mod p being random, which is certainly reasonable to believe, then it's uh, the probability that 2 to the p minus 1 congruent to 1 mod p squared is, is quite small. And then this was extended in various ways to 3 to the p minus 1 and so forth. And there's some dispute whether Morishima actually did it. Uh, but I will accept the, the secondary literature. I certainly am not going to read the proof. It's really ugly. Uh, you get 3 to the p minus 1, you know, 5 to the p minus 1, up to 43 to the p. Right. And all those must be true. Whether they're true or not is another, you know, whether, certainly 
they've been, I mean, there were independent proofs up to about 31, so whether the last few are true is still subject to some dispute. Uh, the trouble with, um, with any, both these kinds of theorems is that it doesn't make you, I mean, it says, it says that exceptions are rare. But now what I want to do is, is, is state in the time remaining um, a theorem due to Eichler, uh, well, and its precursor due to Kras uh, Krasner, that make it seem, if one believes any realistic probability arguments on what the class group of Q zeta p should look like, makes it impossible to believe that there are any counterexamples the first case, even, you know, we knew this essentially 50, 40 years ago. And so I want to state two theorems and then do a probabilistic calculation, which I learned from Larry. Uh -huh. And the two theorems are the following. This is a theorem of Krasner of 1934. And his theorem is if the first case, well, if the first case is not true, for a prime p, then the first, well, greatest integer in the cube root of log p Bernoulli numbers Divisible by P. Last, Pardon? Last, not first. The last? P minus one, two. They're going down, you're right. Oh, the last. Okay, you're right. Okay. Now, this is extremely unlikely because um, if you believe Bernoulli numbers are random mod P, then to have. Um, a large number of consecutive ones um, is. Oh, we don't know what Bernoulli numbers are? Uh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, what's the problem, Andrew? Oh, I'm sorry. Whenever you do, I thought. I'm thinking like an algebraic number theorist. Whenever you do calcu whenever you do anything with Fermat, I apologize. Um, you have to look. The Bernoulli numbers come up in the formula for H minus. You know, B, B. Well, whatever. I can't. I don't have time to sort of go into it. But anyway, uh, Kummer's main theorem is connects the well. And now we have the converse of Herbrand's theorem and Ribbitt's theorem and Mazur Wiles and everything else. But basically, the Bernoulli numbers give you the eigenspaces. If you believe Van der Ver's conjecture, they really do give you the eigenspaces. But essentially, they give you the order of the ith eigenspace. In other words, bi, if you let the Galois group of q zeta p act on the class group, then the ith eigenspace order is given by the ith Bernoulli number, more or less. Anyway. OK. OK, but anyway, what I want, I'm sorry, I'm trying to run. OK, Eichler's theorem is the most interesting theorem, and that's the one I want to talk about. And I don't know if I'll have time to prove it. Uh, he proved the following amazing theorem. Uh, so let's make a de let's use the standard definition that the index of irregularity is the number of p uh, that divide the, the jth Bernoulli number for j equals 2, 4, up to p minus 3. So those are the ones that come up in the calculus. Okay? And then what Eichler showed, well, actually, um, it's Eichler. And Eichler showed it for the class group, uh, and then Iwasawa and a couple of other people changed it to the index of irregularity. What he proved is that essentially, if I of p is less than the square root of p minus 2, the first case is true. And 
This isn't going to happen if you believe anything realistic. And let me show you why. Okay, so the, if let's assume the probability that P divides one of these Bernoulli numbers is 1 over P. Okay, which would, one would sort of believe if they're random. Um, then the probability <coughs> that I of P, the index of irregularity, is k is by sort of standard probability theory p minus 3 because that's how many things we have over 2 because we're only looking at the even ones choose k 1 minus 1 over p to the 1 half p minus 3 minus k times 1 over p to the k. And that's just a standard calculation in probability theory where you essentially calculate the probability, I mean, this, the formula comes by calculating the probability that the index of irregularity is not k rather than the index is k. And then, according to my probabilis, probabilist friends, this is called the Poisson distribution of weight K, and it's not too hard to show that this approaches one half to the K e to the minus one half over K factorial. Okay. So what do we so what do we get? We get I of P equals zero. In other words, P is a regular prime for approximately well e to the minus one half, which is equal to 0 0.6065. And I of p is greater than one, greater than or equal to one, is therefore 0 0.3035. And here's the data up to 125,000. Did I do, did I not add it right? 3935. I should read my notes instead of trying to do arithmetic. 3935 it is. And here's the data we have. I of P, oh, this is up to 125,000, equals zero for 0.6075, which ain't bad. And I of P is greater than zero for point, this time, I will try not to. So the probabilistic uh, uh, argument that the Bernoulli numbers are random mod p, the, except for the ones that are zero, namely the, other, the non even ones, uh, does agree with what data we have. And now we play a little magic game with uh, Eichler's theorem. So what is the probability that the index of irregularity is greater than the square root of p minus 2? Well, Roughly speaking, it should be of this order of magnitude. It's approximate, it's k greater than the square root of p minus 2, e to the minus 1 half, 1 half to the k, divided by k factorial, because of the, just adding up the individual probabilities. And of course, this is less than the following. 1 over 2 to the k, 1 over k factorial. So for an individual prime, we get that this is, this is the probability of a counterexample for that prime. So now, did I make a mistake? No, that's right. And k is equal to the greatest integer in the square root of p minus 1. And now we want to figure out what's the probability of finding a counterexample. So we want to sum these things over all p sufficiently large. So we end up with summation p greater than or equal to whatever Joe's current number is. Uh, I don't know. Uh, in other words, this is where we already have eliminated them. Certainly you can take, I think it's 
way past four million, but um, one half square root of p minus one, one over square root of p minus one factorial, which is very, which is so close to zero that a physicist would regard it as being equal to zero. It's roughly, for p greater than four million, it's less than one over ten to the ten thousandth. So, the, and by the way, this is the problem, this is the number of expected exceptions, the number of primes for which the index of irregularity should be greater than the square root of p minus two. So it's the number of primes is less than one over ten to the ten thousandth which is substantially less than one, so one expects not there not to be a whole lot of counterexamples. And so on that note, I'll end. I should say that the conference proceedings, um, which I remind you are for sale uh, at a, a pre-publication price, um, we'll have all the various proofs and all the things worked out. They're not particularly perspicuous and they take a long time. Uh, there are no good proofs that I could find in the literature of Eichler's theorem. Uh, so if anyone has a, a nice proof and would convey it to me before I write down the ugly proof, I would be real happy to know it.